before we come to the investors panel now, looking at uh, what is the vision for Africa, I should um, tell you now that um, in 15 minutes' time, we are starting our workshop sessions, which go on in parallel to the sessions here. They're just next door uh, on the stage too, just, just literally there. Um, they are going to be looking more at human capital, at basically physical uh, resources too, including construction. So for example, the first session, um, which I'll be chairing actually, is about becoming an incredible employer and solving the employment crisis, bringing sexy back to the hospitality industry. Two very good hoteliers talking to me there. That's followed by uh, a session on managing rising construction costs and providing solutions. So that is gonna be going on in 15 minutes time from the other room. This room is much more about finance uh, and this split stage thing is going on until about mid-afternoon. So be aware, be aware of that and please feel free to go into either session depending on what you're interested in. So can I now please introduce uh, Wayne. Uh, Wayne Godwin is um, the head of hotel advisory in sub-Saharan Africa. He has had a very interesting and long journey getting here, which he may tell you about, I don't know. Um, but he focuses on delivering strategic advisory services and capital market oversight to local, regional, and global clients across sub-Saharan Africa. He's got over 13 years' experience in the hospitality real estate industry, so he knows what he's talking about, we hope. I'm sure he does. <laughs> okay, Wayne, over to you to introduce Thank your panel. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, certainly always fun and interesting traveling around Africa, but that's why we love it, right? So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. It to take 50 hours, but it is good to be here. Um, I lead uh, JLL's Hotels and Hospitality Group, as you, you heard, um, and uh, we've got a great panel uh, today, really taking a deep dive into hospitality investment on, on the continent. Um, now, before I introduce my panel and, and call them up, I thought it would just be good to just take a few minutes to set the scene around what we're seeing as JLL uh, globally and regionally around the flow of capital into hospitality. Um, I think the first and arguably most important point is the trends that we're seeing internationally and globally around investment are absolutely re reverberating and impacting investment in Africa. Uh, so, so it really is important to kind of keep that perspective. And then the second thing you know, one really cannot discuss investment into hospitality in this current recovery context without, um, without linking it to performance recovery and, and seeing how capital is behaving relative to recovery. So, you know, performance globally is definitely recovering. It's, it's, it's a relatively good story, actually. Despite high inflation, rising interest rates, geopolitical headwinds, um, performance is, is recovering. To year to date, across sort of major markets, we're at rev par levels of about 90% of what we had in 2019. Uh, regionally, we saw the numbers yesterday, good rev par recovery across a, a number of uh, markets and, and slowly getting back up to sort of 2019 levels. Um, what does this mean for investment? I mean, I think that's, that's the critical question. Well, globally, investment is also at a near pandemic levels. Um, we expect to see a lot more activity in, still in the next few months. There's a lot of um, debt in, still in the market that is going to mature and a lot of deferred capex and, and depleted FF&E reserves. So the sector still needs capital, and, and there is a lot of capital still out there for it to come. But we are starting to see this curtail and a bit of a slowing, muted appetite uh, reverberating globally. So really, it, it's, it's starting to become about this disconnect between, um, disconnect between strong hotel fundamentals, the economy, liquidity, and debt markets. Debt is now also a lot more expensive, and this is starting to price out a number of buyers for, for hospitality. Um, and, and in particularly a lot of institutional investors who 
their allocation of global investment volumes has fallen by roughly half since 2019. Okay, well, what does that mean? Who are the active buyers at this stage of the cycle? Well, private equity is still leading uh, investment volumes. Year to date, uh, approximately 33% of investment volumes coming from private equity. Uh, that's down from about 50% last year. Uh, within Africa, the majority of investment has also come from, from private equity um, the last two years. So, so if, this, if private equity is the largest purchaser, well, in globally, single assets are the target. Um, we've seen a lot more focus the last two years on single assets versus portfolios. Um, and this is really as sellers embrace or owners embrace a sell now rather than later approach given some of these headwinds. Willingness to sell and willing sellers have absolutely underpinned liquidity through Africa. Um, and, and we're seeing, in particularly with the absence of government stimulus, etc., balance sheets absolutely need fresh new capital coming into the sector. Um, and this is, this is going to remain for the next few years. So you can see quite quickly a picture emerging that while investment volumes are quite similar to pre-pandemic, um, the, the context and the structure, very different, of course. Uh, investment in Africa is still very much development focused, right? Uh, this has reduced significantly since pre-pandemic, but I think and it's a discussion through the course of this, this conference, that the quality of that pipeline probably has improved somewhat. By contrast, acquisition activity, whilst it peaked in 2016 and then 2018, if you really took an average between 2016 and 2019, you would see that investment volumes the last two years have been in line with that pre-pandemic level in Africa. So that's, that, that is very positive. But like globally, capital has augmented and, and the profile changed and definitely consolidated. So if we start looking ahead into next year, um, globally we expect to see REITs being a lot more active and other lower leveraged uh, investors given increasing debt cost. Uh, in Africa, pension funds and local pension funds, we still believe there's a lot of liquidity that can come into real estate. Uh, countries like Nigeria, Botswana, Mauritius, still well below the, the global norm allocation of around 7% of for real estate. Other countries, Kenya, Z uh, Zambia, uh, Tanzania, quite a bit higher than that. So it's not a homogenous story, but um, definitely a lot more capital can come into the region from that institutional perspective. Um, we also expect to see the debt markets start opening up in 2023, led by DFIs and select commercial banks. Um, and already we've started to notice just in the last two months a bit of a material shift in appetite and, and, and discussion from banks around the asset class. I think this is going to be quite critical for liquidity in some of the more traditional uh, buyer pools of owner operators and, and high net worths. So what are the other big trends shaping the sector? Well, the one that is probably the loudest and demanding a lot of attention is sustainability and ESG. Uh, the built environment now con uh, well, contributes around 40% of global uh, carbon emissions. And within the built environment, hotels are the most energy intensive use per square meter, right? So there is a big call to action for us as a sector to, to respond. Um, you know, five years ago, the, the conversation was very much around the debate of is sustainable technology accretive to value? Um, where today consumer preference and investor uh, mandates have really propelled the, argue, the, the, well, the, the discussion and uh, the debate is a lot less relevant. In Africa and globally, there's also a lot more focus around uh, sustainability from an acquisition process and valuation methodology is also shifting. So where there aren't the requisite uh, certifications and, and, and strategy around sustainability, uh, brown discounts come into effect because of uh, capex that, that is needed. And I think one of the very interesting points, and this is an investor panel, of course, so 
um, is that there's little, uh, uh, just under $3.9 trillion worth of sustainability assets under management, most of which is raised in Europe. So, and there's also a lot of uh, funds that have been raised now for impact investing, the, the S in ESG, if you will. Um, so, so impact has always been quite a big part of the thesis for hotels in Africa, and that's why there are a lot of DFIs in the room here today. So um, I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to really sort of embrace this and, and make the case for Africa as an impact uh, destination. So when it comes to acquisitions, the situation is actually relatively healthy, despite a sort of concentration of buyers. Uh, development is the challenging piece due to high uh, uh, increasing and high development costs. Um, but this is transitory and, and inflation will start cooling and um, the, the sector clearly has a lot more uh, opportunity and, and for growth. But I think that's, that's, that's enough for me. I'd like to call up my panel um, and, and start introducing them if they want to start making their way up to the stage. <clears throat> Anywhere. Right. Started at the end there. We've got David Damibe, managing partner and uh, CIO for Casada Capital. Um, Sofia Lopez Benhamida, um, uh, managing director for Risma. Uh, Jamil Vergi, founder and CEO of uh, City Blue Hotels, um, and Hamid Sidin, uh, CEO and asset management for Millennium. Great, thanks. Uh, Jamil, maybe let's, let's start with you. I mean, from a recovery perspective in Africa, how, how do you see it? And, and how do you see investors uh, responding through this, this period? And, and particularly, I guess, in the context of these global headwinds that we're, we're seeing, and they're very real, and we heard about them, well, there was discussion around them yesterday. Um, how do you think that these are going to sort of impact the, the recovery um, into next year? Sure. Um. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. To be here, and I think you can hear. I'm on the mic now. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and particularly a pleasure to be here in in Morocco and in Tagazout for the first time. Um, I represent the DR Group, which is uh, the parent company of City Blue Hotels, which I founded uh, almost nine years ago in East Africa. We began in Rwanda, uh, and then opened in Uganda, Kenya, Zambia, and uh, about to open in Tanzania in January. Uh, we're a, a mid-market, three- and four-star um, brand focused on ex the best locations, affordability, service, and technology, um, and a brand that is defined by its culture of celebrating the diversity that is, that is Africa as we see it. Um, we are planning to be in other parts of Africa soon, too, uh, with two properties opening in Ghana in 2024. And uh, a couple of days in Tagazut, and we're certainly looking at Morocco now, too. So I give, I give you that background and context of the question that's been asked, because I don't think we can see the reality of the recovery post-COVID from our lens without looking at it on a case-by-case, country-by-country, and almost city-by-city city perspective. Because if we take Kenya as an example, Mombasa created enormous cash flows for us during COVID when domestic and regional business was the only revenue for the business. Uh, and Nairobi shut shop until air traffic recommenced. And, and, and now it's coming in in, 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 in in waves. So I think one has to assess things very cautiously. In the parts of uh, East and Central Africa that we're operating in, there's a lot of fragility and requirement to be dependent, unfortunately, upon international air traffic. And, uh, and, and, and I think what COVID has done and, and the post-COVID recovery has done is given us an opportunity to assess our business a bit more carefully and determine how we juggle our business and our portfolio. Um, and I think if we look at the, the broader regional recoveries of the big cities, London, Paris, and Dubai, and the rest, I don't think we can en entirely compare those with what's happening um, on the ground. We face the same inflationary issues, the same monetary policy, interest rate issues uh, that 
globally everybody's facing, but we also face localized issues which uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages, either support our growth or, or hinder, hinder the demand side. So it's a, it's a little bit of a mixture, and I think it really depends on each market. Great. <clears throat> David, I think one of the bigger challenges to, to attracting larger institutional capital into an emerging market or Africa is the question on deployment. Um, Casada, as a single asset focused fund, um, on course to being one of the biggest real estate um, platforms in Africa, what, what message does this send to investors uh, globally around uh, this question of deployment for, for within Africa? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Wayne. Uh, basically, the, uh, when we launched the fund, when we launched, launched the firm, um, more or less around the end of 2018, um, and, and raised our first fund in 2019, uh, there was a lot of skepticism about our ability to deploy this capital in this asset class, and most importantly in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is highly fragmented, difficult to, to execute transactions about. But we, we had a, really a, a view that if, if, if we came with solutions to the sector, and those solutions are a lot more multidimensional than just focusing on just acquiring one hotel, right? So it takes uh, financing, it takes thinking a lot about macro. Yeah. I, I sound like a broken record, but I always tell people that investing in frontier markets, regardless of the sector, requires a deep understanding of the macro dynamics and the risk. So we went at it by really bringing in skill set under one platform and in order to solve a, a, an issue. So, um, and not a lot of people thought we were gonna do it. Uh, fast forward since our first acquisition in January 2021, we've deployed half a billion dollars in, in the sector in Africa in about 18 months, right? So that's equity and debt. So, and, and we're well on our way to do that. So I think hopefully you'll prove to to other investors, especially global investors as well, that not only is it doable, but it's scalable as well. And, and, and as far as we're concerned, the Casada view is the more people enter it, the better. Yeah. Um, the more we can basically create a secondary market for, mm. for hotel assets, the better. So, and, and, and we're, we're still in the, in the beginning of our journey, and sure. I think uh, it, could be, it, could, it could get even more scalable and bigger. Yeah. But most importantly also, we, we serve the purpose from an impact perspective. We, We'd started deploying at a very difficult time in the cycle. We've been buying hotels that were either closed or some of them had, uh, had basically let go of a lot of their employees. So we're operating in the past 18 months as the largest counter-cyclical investor in the sector as well, uh, which, which, which is also very, very, very good. Great. Yeah, um, I, I think a lot of the news is made by, by a, lot of the, you know, a number of the big players, and those big players, um, you know, um, make news because of the landmark acquisitions that, they, that they've been getting involved with in recent years, as you mentioned, through private equity. But, but I think on the ground, the reality is there's a huge amount of transactional activity and there's a lot of local capital that does find itself uh, in, in this sector. And, and I think having a presence in those markets um, that we've established in, 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 in particularly the Eastern African countries has allowed us to, to, to be a part of that and, and see that perhaps in a way that isn't documented and isn't necessarily in the press so much. Um, I think from our business, where we, we have uh, effectively a, 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 a company that ha houses our balance sheet, we've got a company that is our, our management company, and we've got a company that uh, houses our brand and our IP. And I think from the perspective of growth and, and scale, I think we are most definitely looking to, to grow in the years ahead on the back of the fact that the development cycle in the markets we're in has been significant in the last decade. But it's dried up. Banks are not lending anymore. Um, there seems to have been a yeah. slowdown in appetite. And for us, there are a lot of hotels that are closed. There's a, lot of, there's a great opportunity to take some over, renovate, and grow with, with conversion, conversion growth as opposed to development growth. And I think that fits the kind of high three, low four star marketplace that we're in. So we're certainly, uh, we're currently, you know, uh, you know, owned 100%. We're, 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 we're debt free and we're considering all kinds of options to be able to scale that out because mm. we think this, this is actually probably the greatest opportunity a group yeah. like ours has had because we're not a, uh, you know, a major, a major brand. So, so yes, I think the opportunities are very clear. Good. 
David, at, at AHIC last year in Dubai, um, you made a prediction that we'd see a significant increase in investment across the continent during the next couple of years. And, and as I mentioned, that's broadly holding true for 2021 and 2022. Um, and while Casada have been one of the big drivers of this trend, uh, putting that aside, how do you see the rest of the sector uh, and capital more broadly responding to to, to these conditions and, and, and the, the, the growth opportunity and, uh, that, that, that has been presented? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I did have inside information in knowing what the activity was. Yeah, no, exactly. In the, in the market going forward. <laughs> on the, on the um, I think the rest of the sector, I think it's great to see, for example, what Jamil's doing on, 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 on in East Africa and, and, and expanding to other countries as well. But I would say that that's probably the, more the exception rather than the norm yeah. of having um, uh, uh, local regional players with no, no debt, well capitalized, um, being clever and smart about their capital. So I think, I, I think aside from private equity and, and, and a few exceptions like, like Jamil, I think that the, the rest of the sector though is, 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 is under duress, right? Yeah. So it's under duress and, sl and, sl and, and sadly it's the result of COVID and now the inflation issue. And again, if you go back to the macro, uh, it's actually not looking great because what's happened is that you already had uh, individual owners who are not necessarily um, from a financing and structural standpoint in good yeah. standing who got um, uh, in, in trouble with, with, with COVID and what happened. Now post-inflation, the second wave that's coming is actually probably even more painful yeah. because before you could use the concept of a pandemic and the bank would say it's a pandemic, right? It's, a, it's an act of God. So let's halt any payment on that. The problem now is that you have an issue where you're going to have, you have rising interest rates, right, that, that are in local currency terms almost off the charts in some of these countries, double digits and sometimes with a two in front. Um, but then the, the underlying danger that's actually going to seep into the system is dollar strength. And, and that's where when you have dollar strength and you have local currency um, um, uh, weakening, the issue is that that flow through to the ADR is not necessarily going to be there. So that's going to result most likely in pressure on debt yeah. again. And yeah. because you're going to have a, any type of mismatch and an owner has in terms of debt versus local currency is going to be put to, to a stress. So it, it's, it, it's, going to become, it's going to continue to be difficult and we, we, we believe this is going to be the case. We, we, we're observing it, we're watching it, and we can bring in solution in, in, in that yeah. case. But I, I think that's going, to be, that's going to be one thing to watch, mm. which is the, the, the derivative effect of COVID and dollar strength yes. creating a, a, a debt problem in, in a lot mm. of these countries. You know? So just to put it in perspective, in Ghana, local interest rates are above 20%, right? So you have inflation shooting up. And as much as you're fighting to have a hotel, uh, trying to catch up in ADRs, you, 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 you still get this macro problem, right? So it's, that's going to be the, the, yeah. the main challenge. This is why we, the sector, and, and, and hopefully more people will come in, that's why the sector needs platforms yes. or institutional investors that have the ability to withstand that mm. and the sophistication to either edge it or at least think about it ahead of time yeah. in, in, order to, in, order, in order to protect themselves. But I guess for lenders as well, you know, it, it's not a solution to, to I guess, have a, a false sense of comfort around where you are now um, and, and kick the can down the road for another few years, right? Because cause I, I guess the, it's only going to catch up, right? The can will be kicked again, I think. And, the, and, and I think it, it's almost counterintuitive. This is why you're mentioning that you're seeing some banks are actually be becoming interested around the sector. I think the banks are starting to be interested in starting to follow institutional investors. Yes. Uh, platforms, sure. and uh, I'm sure if Jamil goes to some of the banks, they'll be more than happy yeah, to open. No, no one's open. talking to me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but the, the, the banks are talking to us as well, and uh, they, they want to follow us yeah, because exactly. they can see the, 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 the scale and the strength. Obviously, in, in, in regions like in, in Morocco and in, yeah. in, in Egypt, it's a bit different, a lot more scalable, a lot, a lot sizable. Yeah. So um, the dynamics might be a bit different. Good. So, Sophia, I mean, I think part of the, the challenging headwinds, etc., that we've seen, we, we, you know, Morocco still presents a, a relatively good story, you know, from an Africa perspective. I mean, what do you think are the fundamentals that are underpinning investor activity and, and interest from, from a Morocco point of view? Well, I, um, I think the main fundamental is, um, is the location, yeah. the more important when you decide to invest in Morocco is to find the best location. 
and uh, so to find the, the good land uh, which uh, has not decreased, the price has not decreased. Uh, there is a lot of, with the crisis, there is a lot of hotels uh, on sale, but the prices for the moment are totally disconnected. Yeah. Uh, maybe because of the lot of helps that the uh, hotel sector uh, had from states and the banks. So, uh, uh, I think we have, well, it's, it's a good time, but we have to wait a little bit because the prices are still very high. So, and we have to, in Morocco, we have to, to have uh, the quality of our hotel is very important. Yeah. Uh, so we saw a lot of uh, hotels to sell, yeah. but the quality is just, uh, we need to destroy the hotel and to become from scratch. Mm. Uh, yeah. How hotel in Morocco has to be compared like the hotel in Europe. <coughs> we have sure. to send the same quality because yeah. the tourist is going to choose between Europe or Morocco. So sure. we have to get the same level yeah. of quality. Absolutely. And I, I think it's that diversification of source markets rather than over-reliance on one particular one that you, you mentioned, which is, is also quite critical. I mean, J Jamil, from a product point of view, how do you sort of see a shift? I mean, we're seeing a lot more lifestyle, but do you think there's some more of an opportunity to do this quite authentically and in a more African sort of um, approach? Uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think uh, there's, I mean, I think coming out of COVID, the, the trends globally of the leisure market that you know, became so significant in, in, in the Western markets and, and the UAE is an example, which I know well, uh, has, has also happened significantly in, in, in the sub-Saharan markets that we operate in. So we're seeing a lot of changes in, in, in the behavior of, of, of business and leisure uh, guests. And I think, yes, I think that you know, the days of a classic boutique, boutique hotel have changed, the days of a classic resort have changed, people will come um, for long periods of time and uh, uh, to, you know, to a coastal hotel and spend, spend time working there. And the hybrid model of, of all of our lives has, has impacted upon this industry. So we definitely see, see those changes. I think the other thing to add is that we opened uh, an extended stay. I know that Trevor uh, mentioned uh, uh, the, 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 the movement towards extended stay products in, in, in the last few years. And we've opened one in Nairobi, um, uh, in Westlands. And it's, it's just opened in the last 12 months and it's been very successful so far with a blend of short stay and long stay. And I think that's also a trend that we'll now, you know, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot more of uh, across these markets. And I think that also plays into the, 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 pleasure, the pleasure market. So, so those, are, those are some of the, 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 the trends we see. Good. <clears throat> Hamid, and I'm, I'm going to follow up the question with you as well, David. But, you know, with COP27 now happening this month in Africa, um, where, where do you sort of see the opportunity from, a, from an investor perspective in Africa, or from an ESG perspective? Is there a big opportunity to capitalize on the S um, in, in ESG? I, I think uh, everywhere we have, we have mm -hmm. opportunities and uh, um, distressed assets can be a big, a big opportunity for us and uh, for, for, the, for the, the whole Middle Eastern and uh, yeah, I believe that mm. uh, is there, mm. we, we have this uh, opportunity and we are willing to, to take it. And yesterday we had uh, some, uh, some uh, discussion to, to find how we can work together because we, can, uh, we, we, we don't have any, um, any uh, experience uh, in Africa and we are counting on people to, to uh, take us with them and to partner to have a, a very strong partnership in, in, in mm. Africa. David, I'm going to sort of change the question subtly. You know, you know, there's obviously a lot of capital out there internationally. I mean, is this sort of a creative and sort of possibly uh, way that we can start attracting more of that? Uh, definitely, yes. Yeah. definitely yes. Definitely yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. I, I, think, I think on the um, uh, creative, yes, yeah. but let's make sure that we, we, we don't do that for the sake of being sure. creative and, and raising capital. I think for, for us, what we're, the way we're looking at it is, you know, we're, in a, we're, 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 we're blessed to have been given this capital to invest in this sector, and especially in a cycle that, that where it's difficult. 
but secondly, we, we need to do the right thing with our capital, and as we deploy our capital, uh, have a certain level of impact that could be transformational in the yeah. sector. So we've invested a lot of time, money, and, and also in human capital for us to, to get there. So we work a lot with the World Bank, the EDGE program, ret retrofitting the, the, the assets we're buying. We're, we're, we're really developing a, a very granular ESG strategy, and, and from, from the E to the, to, to the S, yeah. to obviously to the G. So, so I think, and, and then, and then the, the benefits of that is, you know, you know, better impact, and then the, the, the second derivative of that is investors are also looking to that in order to fund you from, from senior loans, senior yeah. debt, green bonds, uh, uh, et cetera. So once, once we look at our platform from a long-term perspective, and we think we're going to get quite scalable, it, you, you cannot exist in the near future um, if you don't have that, that, yeah. that, that, that executed. Mm -hmm. So we, we are in, we're spending a lot of our time at, that, sure. at the senior level in our firm to think about that. Yeah. Good. Sophia, last question for you. I mean, do you expect the next few years in Morocco to present buying opportunities uh, for investors? You said a lot of, lot of assets coming to market, questions around the val values and expectations. Um, do you think there is going to be a sort of um, more reality setting in and, and transactions occurring? Yes, um, I think, as I said previously, I think there are going to be opportunity for investors. Uh, but once again, we have to be cautious with not only with the new rise in interest rate. Yep. Uh, but it, it will be become more complicated uh, for the investor because the sector has already experienced a uh, high level of gearing. Uh, so it will be complicated to find the, yeah. the money. But I think opportunity will get opportunity to find. Uh, to invest. It's how to finance this opportunity will be maybe more complicated. Yeah. Jamil, your view, what, what do the next few years hold? Uh, <laughs> let's hope there's no more, no more pandemics or, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's very hard to see too far ahead, but we always make our plans. <laughs> we look as far ahead as we can. Uh, for us, uh, going into 2023, we have a, a a period of consolidation post-COVID. We're bringing in a lot more properties that uh, were in the pipeline that slowed down during COVID and are now, by the end of next year, going to take us hopefully across the 1,000 key uh, threshold, which for us is you know, an, an important marker and will help us double up um, hopefully by 2025. So our game plan is to consolidate our, our, our situation in East Africa, open in, in, in Ghana and start a push into West Africa and see where things go from there. Great. Our time's nearly up, but David, I'll, I'll give you the last question, a fairly simple one. What does 2023 hold in store for Casada? So for us, it's, it's really uh, the, the first phase uh, was, uh, each phase has, has, has a lot of complexity, but the first phase was um, proving that it's, cap it's, it's possible to deploy damage capital in such a fragmented market, phase one. Phase two, it's basically the phase of what, what we would call value creation, led by uh, probably the the largest multi-jurisdictional capex program in hotels that, we'll, 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 that we've started. <clears throat> so that's, that's really going to encompass our 2023 yeah. a consolidating phase. We'll continue, obviously, to invest as well. And, uh, and, and also um, starting to look at markets north of the Sahara, basically, starting to look at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, at North Africa, Morocco, Morocco and Egypt, um, and where we think that what we've achieved already and, and with our partners on uh, the operating side on Accor, we, we, we have quite a lot to bring. So it's really the, the next phase in our cycle, and as investors, you need to get to three phases in order yeah, to, to, sure. to do well, and, and we're, we're entering into phase two, yeah. Good. Well, folks, I think that's, that's our time. I think the key takeaways for me, if investment fundamentals still largely intact, but it's, it's really tough out there. Uh, macro headwinds rising, um, and, and it's going to be bumpy. But, but I think we've got to keep in context that a continent with only 1% of the global hotel supply presents a huge opportunity um, still, and we need, to, we need to focus on that and not, not lose sight. So thank you very much to my panelists for joining me today. It's uh, always a pleasure to, to be at AHIF, and thanks to the bench team. But uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you. <laughs>